Welcome everybody to the Big Read and No Lake County. This month we're having it here. Christopher couldn't make it because we are short-staffed, so I'm going to read you his comments. He says, thank you so much for coming out to participate in the Big Read. If you don't know, the NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowments for the Arts designed to broaden our understanding of our world, our communities, ourselves, through the joy of sharing a good book. Lake County is one of 75 nonprofit organizations to receive the grant to host a community reading program between September 2017 and June 2018. The NEA Big presents NEA Big Read in partnership with Arts Midwest. The NEA Big Read in Lake County is happening all month long featuring Emily St. John Mandel's Station 11. Station 11 was chosen for our Big Read last year by a community survey. Station 11 is a haunting novel about the events preceding and after a pandemic destroys civilization as we know it. Shifting back and forth in time and viewing events from multiple perspectives, it primary, primarily follows a Shakespeare troupe who travels by horse and buggy. <coughs> they survive by performing for small towns and outposts and have formed after the pandemic disaster, dis devastated society. So there's, we're gonna reenact some of the book here today. I have some thanks to um, do before we get started. First of all, I'd thank, like to thank the Soberese and Carol Hayes for this beautiful venue. Everything's so nice and lovely here, and, and they make it so easy to have a program here. I'd like to thank John Tomlinson and the actors. Greg Bushta and the musicians. And the friends of the Lake County Library, they provide the refreshments and they do lots of nice things for the library. So if you want to support them. And I'd like to thank Beth with LCP TV and Peg TV. They're here to film us. They film us every month for the No Lake County programs. And I'd also like to thank you, the participants, for sharing in the big read with us. So we're going to do music next. I'm not sure. Greg, do you want to introduce the music? We're going to do a waltz called Cash Grove.
discussion started, I thought I'd ask a question that was asked of the author. She was asked, what would you say one item if you were an apocalypse? So now it's your turn. I'm going to send some mics around. So anybody want to say what they'd like to say? If they could say one item. <laughs> Very handy. <laughs> I'd say a pair of binoculars. A pair of binoculars? That's a good one. Mine would be my mother. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to know what the author? Oh, we got another answer? I'd probably save a calendar just can't. to keep myself straight. A calendar? <laughs> My wine cellar. <laughs> In the book they do they do find some wine. <laughs> Do you want to hear what the, the author said? <laughs> she said that she would like to save a globe because it would help her to see beyond her own area. She would know there was a bigger world out there. So now we're going to go into, we're going to set up the scene for the dramatic uh, reading of King Lear. And the actors are going to do that right now. What we have here is a scene from King Lear. Uh, my name is John Tomlinson. I am an instructor for Mendocino College and a member of Lake County Theater Company, as are the rest of the group here, members of Lake County Theater Company. Uh, Tim Barnes here, Laura Barnes, Barbara Clark, and Fallon Diener. And we are going to read a scene from King Lear. We chose this scene, we chose a scene from Lear because it is the setting of the beginning of Station Eleven. And at the beginning of that novel there, the, one of the central figures there actually is performing King Lear and has a heart attack in the middle of his performance. So it's really uh, quite an engaging beginning to the, to the novel. In the play, just to set the scene of what we're talking about here, because we're going to use a bunch of big Shakespeare words, and so I want you to be set up to understand what we're talking about. King Lear is aging, and he wants to retire. He's decided to divide his kingdom into three parts for his three daughters. His older two daughters have already married. The eldest, Goneril, has married the Duke of Albany. The middle daughter, Reagan, has married the Duke of Cornwall. The youngest daughter, Cordelia, has been courted by the Duke of Burgundy and the Duke of France, but is not yet betrothed to either. In this scene, King Lear states that this matter will be decided today. All of these pairings, of course, have serious political overtones in terms of alliances for the future of the land. The setting is in the court of the castle with many bystanders. And in order to determine how to divide his kingdom and to which daughter to give the best land as her dowry, he asks them in this scene to profess their love to him, and they will be rewarded according to how moved he is by their tributes. This is Act 1, Scene 1. I will be performing King Lear, Tim Barnes as Kent, Lear's trusted confidants, and the three daughters, Laura Barnes as Goneril, Barbara Clark as Regan, and Fallon Diener as Cordelia. And so what we would like you to do also is to be transported to the castle and be in that time and be part of the court that this is happening in front of. Because part of Lear's great misery is this is happening in public, as we come to see. Okay? Uh, and because Lear, as such, as the grandiose tyrant that he is, he expects certain behaviors in the court from everyone, and in particular, all should practice the honored tradition of royal butt kissing. <laughs> 
Meantime, we shall express our darker purpose. Give me the map there. Know that we have divided in three our kingdom, and tis our fast intent to shake our cares and of business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths, while we unburdened crawl toward death. Our son of Cornwall, and you are no less a living son of Albany, we have this hour a constant will to publish our daughter's several dowers that future strife may be prevented now. The princes, France, and Burgundy, great rivals in our youngest daughter's love, long in our court have made their amorous sojourn, and here are to be answered. Tell me, my daughters, uh, uh, since now we will divest us both of rule, interest of territory, cares of state, <laughs> Which of you, shall we say, doth love us most? Uh, that we our largest bounty may extend where nature doth with merit challenge. Goneril, our eldest born, speak first. Sir, I love you more than words can wield the matter. Dearer than eyesight, space, and liberty. Beyond what can be valued, rich or rare. No less than life, with grace, health, beauty, honor, as much as a child e'er loved or father found, a love that makes breath poor and speech unable. Beyond all matter of so much, I love you. What should Cordelia do? Pop and be silent. Of all these bounds, even from this line to this, with shadowy forests and with champagnes rich, with plenteous rivers and wide skirted meads, we make thee, lady, to thee and Albany's issue be this perpetual. What says our second daughter, our dearest Reagan, wife to Cornwall? Speak. Sir, I am made of the self-same metal that my sister is, and praise me at her words. In my true heart, I find she names the very deed of love, only she comes too short. <laughs> I profess myself an enemy to all other joys, which the most precious square of sense possesses. And I find I alone felicitate in your dear highness's love. Then poor Cordelia. And yet, not so. Since I am sure my love's more richer than my tongue. To thee and thine hereditary ever remain this ample third of our fair kingdom, no less in space, validity, and pleasure than that conferred on Goneril. Now, our joy, although the last not least, to whose young love the vines of France and milk of Burgundy strive to be interest, what can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters? Speak. Nothing, my lord. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. Unhappy that I am, I cannot keep my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond, nor more nor less. How, how, Cordelia, mend your speech a little, lest it mar your fortunes. Good, my lord. You have begot me, bred me, loved me. And I return those duties back as our right fit. Obey you, love you, and most honor you. Why have my sisters husbands, if they say they love you all? Happily, when I shall wed, that lord whose hand must take my plight shall carry half my love with him, <coughs> half my care and duty. Sure, I shall never marry like my sisters. 
to love my father all. But goes thy heart with this? Aye, good my lord. So young and so untender. So young, my lord, and true. Let it be so. Thy truth, then, be thy dower. For by the sacred radiance of the sun, the mysteries of Hecate and the night, for all the operations of the orbs from whom we do exist and cease to be, here I disclaim all my paternal care, propinquity, and property of blood, and as a stranger to my heart and me, hold thee from this forever. Good, my liege. Peace, Kent. Come not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most, and thought to set my rest on her kind nursery. Hence, and avoid my sight! So be my grave, my peace, as I hear I give her father's heart from her. Call France, who stirs? Call Burgundy. Cornwall and Ar Albany, with my two daughters' dowers, digest this third. Let pride, which she calls plainness, marry her. Do invest you jointly with my power, preeminence, and all the large effects that troop with majesty. Royal Lear, whom I have ever honored as my king, loved as my father, as my master followed, as my great patron, thought on in my The prayer. bow is bent and drawn. Make from the shaft. Let it fall, rather. <clears throat> Though the fork invade the region of my heart, be Kent unmannerly? When Lear is mad, what wilt thou do, old man? Thinkest thou that duty shall have dread to speak when power to flattery bows? To plainest honors bound when majesty stoops to folly. Reverse thy duty, and in thy best consideration, check this hideous rashness. Answer my life, my judgment. Thy youngest daughter does not love thee least, nor are those empty-hearted whose low sound reverbs no hollow. Can't on thy life no more. Uh, my life I never held but as a pawn to wage against thy enemies, nor fear to lose it, thy safety being the motive. Out of my sight! See back. And let me remain the true blank of thine. And that's our scene. John is now going to discuss the connection between Station Eleven and King Lear and Midsummer Night Dream. Good, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. As, as I mentioned, we have a connection here with the first scene uh, of the book, which is um, reflected, like I said, in, and our lead character has a heart attack on the stage. And many of the characters we come to know throughout the book are, are also part of that opening uh, scene. Is that, just, is that just theater talk, or do you call it an opening scene in a book, too? I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, and to me, part of what resonates about that piece uh, the piece of King Lear, and, and especially this opening sequence, this opening scene of the play, and this world that we're dealing with, is that we're, we're thinking of the future of the land. We're thinking of um, settling things before, in, in Lear's case, before the crisis comes, before he dies. He wants to settle things. Part of what he says, he wants to decide on who's going to have the land, because... The dukes otherwise are going to marry his two daughters and then fight, and then his two daughters are fighting, and the family is fighting with each other. So there's some foresight, and of course the whole setting of Station Eleven is kind of about the future of the land and what our decisions are going to do to our own futures. Midsummer Night's Dream will have a scene coming up also soon, and, and that play also is part of the story, and in fact the the players that play Oberon and Titania. Uh, Titania is a major player. She's Kristen and Kirsten, excuse me, in the, in the book, if you've read, and um, 
place to Tanya here, and they, you know, um, also are dealing with kind of the same thing. If you know the setup in A Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, the start of the play is that Oberon and Titania are fighting, and their love has affected the very spirit world. And so um, I'll talk more about that as we set up the scene, but there's a similar theme of uh, our actions and what it does to the rest of the world, our environment, um, not just in an ecological sense, but also somewhat in a spiritual sense, which I think connects to some larger meanings in this. I think then the next thing is a little bit more music. We have a bit of a costume change, and we'll be back out here soon. Thank you.
So we could stall a little bit. I can ask another question. In the book, Station Eleven, there are some people stranded at a airport, and they start a museum of lost items that they can no longer use. Phones, credit cards, uh, computers. What would you put in the Museum of Civilization and why? Does so anybody have a... Over here. I put my piano that my husband bought me when we were engaged. <laughs> and uh, I mean as a wedding present, and that's what I put it. You'd put your piano. Yes. You'd always have music. Yes. That's lovely. I'd put a washing machine. <laughs> but you, you have no electricity at this point. <laughs> well, how about a, uh, one of those washboards? <laughs> there you go. I would put a telephone because I think it was an invention that changed how we communicate around the world. Put a telephone. I'd put all the great books I could find. Shakespeare especially. Shakespeare and in, in books. That's nice. I'd put in a camera, a digital camera. Um, I'd put a light bulb in so that I could remember what it was like. <laughs> Some of them are quite decorative, too. <laughs> I think I'd put a Bible. A Bible. Give us, give us a good start. Yeah. Vintage LP records, vinyl, old, records, vinyls. I would put uh, paintings. Paintings? Yes, uh, and also uh, watercolor and uh, oil paint, so you'll be able to paint also, or remember how to oil paint. Keep the art. Very nice. I put a sewing machine. <laughs> It'd have to be one of those ones run by treadle. <laughs> Sewing machine. I think I put okay. a pen and, well, as many pens and pencils as I could, because I know when they run out, we won't have any more. <laughs> True. Excellent. Are you ready back there? Are they ready? They're ready. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Midsummer Mid Night's Dream. So, a yeah. Midsummer Night's Dream. I have some notes here <laughs> about the scene here from this. <laughs> hey! Thank you, Jeremiah. Hank Lev, our new intern. A Midsummer Night's Dream is also part of the story in Stations 11, as it's visited twice, once in rehearsal and then once later in a performance setting. Uh, this play is about love and strife. It's set in a magical world of fairies, spirits, and spells. And in this scene in particular, with Bottom, a local worker, and Titania, the queen of the fairies, this happens after a spell has been cast on Bottom to make him half human, half donkey. And Titania has been given a potion which will cause her to fall in love with the first creature she sees when she awakens. Guess what? He's the creature she sees! So that's this scene that we're about to see. Uh, this scene was not in the novel, but it was in Mendocino College and Lake County Theater production, Lake County Theater Company's inaugural production of Shakespeare at the Lake. And we have a couple of actors from that performance with us for tonight. Thank you. We have uh, two of the actors from that original performance. Uh, Tim Barnes will be playing Bottom and uh, Barbara Clark playing Titania, and joining them we have Fallon Diener as one of the fairies. So now, here is a scene from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Bottom! Thou art changed! Bottom? Thou art... translating! I see their knavery. 
This is to make an ass of me. <laughs> to scare me, if they could. But I will not move from this spot. Do what they can. I shall walk up and down here, and I will see you. So that they will hear I am not afeard. He also oh, cock so black of hue with orange tawny bill. The Russell with his note so true. The wren with little queer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what angel wakes me from my flowery bed? <laughs> the finch, the sparrow, and the lark, the plain song cuckoo gray, whose note of any man doth mark, but dare not answer nay. <laughs> For in truth, who would give the bird such a lie that he'd cry cuckoo never so? I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Ah! Oh. <laughs> My ear is much enamored to thy note, as is thine eye enthralled to thy shape. And thy own virtues force per force doth move me on first view to say, to swear, I love thee. <laughs> Methinks, mistress, you have little reason for that. No, reason and love keep little company these days. <laughs> it is a shame that some honest neighbors would not make them friends. Nay. <laughs> Well, I could bleak upon occasion. Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Oh, not so neither. <laughs> but if I had enough wit to get out of this wood, I would have enough to serve my own turn. Out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rate. The summer still doth tend upon my state, and I do love thee. Therefore, go with thee. I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee. Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Oh, take him. Lead him to my bower. The moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye, and when she weeps, weeps every little flower, lamenting some enforced chastity. <laughs> Tie up my love song. Bring him silently.
was so pretty. And it kind of sets the scene that's coming up of two people who once loved and now are fighting. So in another scene from Midnight Summer's Midsummer Night's Dream, Oberon and Titania, the king and queen of all the fairyland, are in a strife. And it's affected the whole world of the play. In this sense, Titania describes in great detail the cosmic fallout of their conflict. All of the nature is in revolt, but why? Well, they are fighting over a little magical child that Oberon wants for his fairy tribe, while Titania wants to keep the child and take care of him. This scene, which precedes the one we just saw in the text, is where the, we first see the fairy world, and we also meet Oberon and Titania for the first time. This scene is a part of the story of Station Eleven as well. The actors who play the fictional couple Oberon and Titania are actually a real couple, a couple in real life. Their troubles as a couple are a backdrop to the need to get along with the, the actors on stage, or at least work well together. For an extra twist, they play characters who are fighting, and it's a confusing world, as so many of Shakespeare's stories are. So here we're going to have a scene from Midnight Summer's Midsummer Night's Dream. Not 
Shun me, and I will spare your haunts. Give me that boy, and I will go with thee. Not for thy fairy kingdom. Fairies away, but we shall chide downright if I long stay. Well, go thy way. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. So in our final discussion on the book, I wanted to tell you that we have Four more programs coming up. We have a program at Mendocino College tomorrow, which is writer Jody Gehrman at 2 o'clock. Survival is because survival is insufficient. So everybody's welcome to that. Then at the Lakeport Library on Wednesday evening, 10 on October 25th at 5 o'clock, we're going to show the Star Trek Voyager program that she took. Survival is insufficient. That was the theme through the book. We're going to show that one. And that's at the Lakeport Library, Wednesday evening. Then Sutter Lakeside Hospital, Tammy Carter is coming to talk about surviving the apocalypse, fact and fiction. And that's on Saturday, 10-28 at 2 p.m. at the Lakeport Library. And then on October 28th, Christopher, our, our um, library director will be at KPFC on bookends and he will be discussing um, the book there. So you can tune that in on Saturday the 28th. And also I wanted to mention that we had two brewers in the area. O'Mara Brothers did a Station Eleven brew. You can go to their pub and taste that. And Kelsey Creek Brewing in Kelseyville did the Traveling Symphony Pale Ale, so you can do that. And I wanted to say one more thing about No Lake County. What did this teach us about Lake County? The program is to, No Lake County is to help you get to know Lake County, and I think what it taught us is how talented some of our people are, the musicians and the actors, and how wonderful and how nice Lake County is, how much talent we have here. So they're going to play us one more piece to finish off. Thank you so much.
like to mention that the symphony and the actors just came off some big programs. The symphony is going to have some programs coming up. I'm going to let Greg talk about that. And so it was very big-hearted of both teams to come out and do for us. The producers was just on with the actors, and so everybody's been really busy, but they've been really kind to help. And I'll let Greg tell you what's coming up. And I don't know if John had anything he wanted to talk about, but we'll put Greg on first. Coming up on November 19th, the symphony is going to be having a Schumann and Tchaikovsky concert. Starts, we have the rehearsal at 11, which is open rehearsal, and then the concert starts this year at 2 o'clock. Elizabeth McDougall is the guest pianist. Maybe you can just hear me from here. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth McDougall is the guest pianist for the Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto. So you won't want to miss that. She's an excellent pianist. And where is it? Right here at the Socrates. Thank you everybody for coming and for participating in the Big Read. It's very nice to have you all here. And if you want to see the program again, it will be on disc, a DVD at the library. So thank you very much for coming.